Welcome everyone to the second iPod for chapter 7. This will uh, be covered on day 10. We, we know that many of the concepts in this part of the chapter can be a little uh, confusing at times. So we want to take uh, a little bit of time to go over this with you in this uh, short podcast. Again, as with the previous podcast, I'm going to take out a blank piece of paper and rewrite the things that you see on the board here and we think that will help um, you retain the important information from this chapter to be used in uh, connection with your note-taking guide. Again, this isn't a substitute for the note-taking guide. It's just to complement it. Let's first begin with this term called diffusion. Now what does this word mean? We've used it a lot in everyday language, but what it means simply is the movement of particles so they spread evenly into an open space. So let's go ahead and write that down. So what does this mean in practice? A good example of this is if we're to think about a bottle of perfume. And so let's draw a little bottle here. Sorry, my drawing isn't, drawings aren't very good. They do the job. So this has perfume in it. And let's pretend there is a cork in it or some kind of plug in it. Now within this bottle, underneath the cork, there are all these molecules bouncing around, colliding with each other, and they evenly fill this space here. Now let's draw a person over here. I know you're shocked that my people look pretty horrible, but it's not a very good skill of mine. And let's draw them farther apart from each other, okay? All right, now, the first thing you might notice is that this is a really huge bottle of perfume, but let's just pretend these people are staying far away so it looks like um, they're, they're the same size. Now, if we remove this cork, so let's just draw an X over this cork to symbolize that we removed it, what's going to happen is that these molecules of the perfume are going to keep colliding with each other, but slowly they're going to start to bounce out of this bottle and they will begin to evenly distribute themselves all around this room until at some point this person here will begin to smell them right here so he now begins to smell them they continue to diffuse around the room until they're nice and evenly distributed until finally this person over here smells them as well. So this is simply diffusion. High concentration of perfume molecules in this bottle. We remove the lid and now this high concentration of molecules begins to spread evenly across this room. So there's an even distribution of perfume molecules. Now this term that we would use to describe this distribution of um, perfume molecules is called equilibrium. In fact, let's go ahead and write that down here. It's an important term that we'll come to every now and then. And all this means is that the molecules are evenly distributed. They're moving in all directions in a similar manner. Now let's bring this concept of diffusion to more of a biological uh, connection. So let's draw a membrane. This could be a biological membrane, but it's just a membrane for our purposes now. And let's say on the left side of this membrane, there is a high concentration of these blue molecules. And there's some on this side, but it's relatively few. What's going to happen now over a course of time is that these molecules, well let me back up first, this membrane here is what we call selectively permeable, meaning that it will only allow the transportation 
um, of certain sized or character type um, molecules. In this case, our blue molecules can go across this, mem this selectively permeable membrane to this other side. And over a period of time, what will happen is that we will have an even distribution of molecules on either side of the membrane. And it's important to note that even though we have equilibrium, as we've used before this term, we have equilibrium, it doesn't mean the molecules aren't moving. These molecules are still moving to this side, and they're still moving to this side. There's nothing to prevent that from happening. It's just that it's at this equilibrium steady state. There's no net gain or net loss on either side of the membrane. In biological terms, what we call this, we don't just call it uh, diffusion, we call this process passive diffusion. So let's go and write that term down here. So a couple features about passive diffusion that we should highlight here. One is that it goes with the concentration gradient meaning it goes from a concentration, a high concentration, my up arrow just shows high concentration, and my C with brackets around it is my symbol for concentration. It goes from a high concentration to a low concentration until it's hit equilibrium. We've already said that, but this is just summarizing it. And because it's going with the concentration gradient, passive diffusion does not require energy. So I'm going to write no energy, meaning we do not require energy for this phenomenon to occur. If you want to look in your textbook, you could look at figure 710. This also shows what I just drew here. But I really think it's important that we learn a lot by drawing things. So I think it's more important that you draw this as opposed to looking at the figure. You look at the figure too, just make sure you draw it as well. So this is passive diffusion. Now, a term that also often goes with the uh, phrase diffusion is osmosis. So let's go ahead and look at the next slide here. So get on a new piece of paper. And let's talk about our good friend osmosis. So osmosis is one of these terms that's, from what I can see, is often misused um, in the popular media. It's simply the diffusion of water. Okay. So let's go ahead and write that here, diffusion of water. Just like regular diffusion, diffusion of water goes from a high concentration to a low concentration of water it also does not require energy. This turns out to be a slightly tougher concept. So let's spend a little bit more time talking about osmosis. Let's go ahead and draw a U-shaped tube here. And let's put a selective permeable membrane here. Now, this membrane only, it's, it's selective permeability only allows water to move across the membrane. Solutes cannot. And let's pretend we're looking at a solution of sugar water. And so let's write solute in this example is the sugar. And the solvent is equal to the water. Regardless of what we're talking about, the solute is always the material being dissolved in the solvent. In biological systems, the solvent will be water. And the solute will be some sus substance. It could be sugar. It could be uh, oxygen. It could be any other substance that is dissolved in the water. Okay. Now... Let's draw some 
sugar molecules here. And let's say the top of the water, in this case, is here and here. So it's even. And we're going to draw a few water, I'm sorry, sugar molecules over here. And on this side, we're going to draw many sugar molecules. Now remember, this permeable membrane here only allows the movement of water. So let's go ahead and write that here. Only water will go across this membrane. And as any, any system, the goal of the system is to reach equilibrium. That is to have the same concentration on both sides. So our goal is to achieve equilibrium. However, well, I'm sorry, let's take a step back. If this was a sugar permeable molecule, the obvious thing that would happen is that the sugar molecules would go across this membrane so that you'd have the same amount of sugar on each side of this membrane. However, as we said before, this membrane here is selectively permeable only to water. Only water molecules will go. So if our goal as we achieve equilibrium is to have the same concentration on either side, the only way to achieve that is to have movement of water. That is, water has to move across this membrane so that you have this, a same, the same concentration. And the way we do that is, well, the way we're going to show that here is that the water on this side of the tube is going to get lower because it's going to move over to here. And the water on this side of the, of the tube will get, will rise. You still have the same number of sugar molecules over here. And you have the same sugar number of sugar molecules on this side as well. The only thing that's changed is the water. And as a result, the concentrations are now equal. The amount of molecules per volume of water is the same on this side as it is on this side. So again, osmosis is the diffusion of water. Water on this side is at a lower concentration, because there's more solute in it, than on this side. Water on this side, let's just put a plus here, is at a higher concentration. On this side, it's at a lower concentration. So water has to move in this direction. Just like any other diffusion, it moves with um, the concentration gradient. As a result of water moving in this direction, we've achieved equilibrium once the concentration of water is the same on both sides. Just like we saw with passive diffusion, water still moving back and forth in each direction. It's just that it's reached this state of equilibrium. So again, to summarize this, osmosis goes from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water until equilibrium is reached. As with passive diffusion, it does not require energy. As a reference, you can go to figure 7.11, and you're going to see a very similar picture on that figure as you see in this um, diagram that we just drew. Again, water going from high concentration to lower concentration until we've hit equilibrium. Now, this is in a U-shaped tube outside of the cell, but let's think about how water is balanced within a living organism, within a functional cell. So let's break out a new piece of paper. Okay, now that we understand the term osmosis and that it's simply just the movement of water from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water. So how does, in a biological system, how does a cell deal with water balance? There are two important terms for us to think about. The first is solute concentration. So in our example on the previous page, our solute concentration was that of glucose. 
And the second thing is membrane permeability. These two terms, these two conditions, solute concentration and membrane permeability, help explain this fancy word called tonicity. And tonicity simply means the ability of a surrounding solution, so a cell sitting in a solution, the ability of that solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. And when we think of tonicity, we can think of three different terms to help explain this. The first is hypotonic. The second is isotonic. Okay, my apologies for that word there. It's probably the worst written word in the history of writing words. It's a little difficult to um, write words on the computer this way. And then the last term is hypertonic. Now, these roots here, hyper, iso, and hypo, are going to be terms that you encounter throughout uh, many science courses. So let's um, right now briefly define them, and then in terms of um, water balance, we'll talk about them again. Hypo means less, so let's write the word less above it. It could also mean lower. Iso means equal. So let's write, let's cheat and just put the equal sign here. And then the last one, hyper, means more or greater. Next, next let's draw some cells here. Okay, so let's think about these terms in relation to the cell. When we talk about a hypotonic solution, what we're saying is that that solution is hypotonic. to the cell. So again, the solution is hypotonic to the cell. What does that mean? That means that we have a lower solute concentration, and I'm going to abbreviate solute concentration this way. I'm going to write solute, and then put brackets around it. This is a common abbreviation for concentration. So. A solution is hypotonic to a cell. That means the concentration of the solute is lower out of the cell. And if that's the case, then these, this also has to be true, that the concentration of water is higher, as shown by my up arrow. The concentration of water is higher out of the cell. So let's draw that up here. A higher concentration of water outside of the cell. And so I'm going to just draw an H2O molecule here. And I'm going to put an up arrow just to symbolize that there's more water outside of the cell than inside the cell. And when that happens, osmosis will occur, causing the concentration of water, where it's high, to move towards where it is low. So it will move into the cell. A result that can happen when this occurs, when we have a net influx of water into the cell, is that the cell could lyse, which means that it will have holes punctured in it, and the contents of the cell will be spilled out, and the cell dies in this case. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but it's really important, so let, let me make sure I say it here. What we're looking at here are animal cells. Now let's jump over here and talk about hypertonic solutions. When we say, when we're dealing with a hypertonic solution, what we're saying is that the solution is hypertonic to the cell. So if a solution that the cell is sitting in is hypertonic to the cell, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have a higher as symbolized by the up arrow, a higher concentration of solute outside the cell. If that is true, a higher concentration of solute outside the cell, then that also means that there is a lower, as shown by the down arrow, lower concentration 
of water outside the cell. So let's draw that up here in relation to the cell. In this case, we have a lower, shown by the down arrow, concentration of water outside the cell. And because osmosis will always move water towards the lower concentration of the cell, meaning we have more water in the cell, it's going to leave the cell, water will, and go outside the cell. When this happens, this cell will shrivel. You know, if you think about it, if you had like a water balloon and you poked a little tiny hole in it, that water is going to slowly leak out until that balloon shrivels. Same thing over here. If you had a water balloon and you hooked it to a hose and you turned that water on and didn't turn it off, at some point that balloon is going to burst. The same thing here when we look at a hypotonic versus a hypertonic solution. Now let's think about our last one here, the isotonic solution. And again, as we've seen with these other ones, what we're saying is that that solution is isotonic to the cell. And what we mean by that, what we mean by a solution being isotonic to the cell, that means the concentration of the water, let me start with the solute, is the same on both sides of the cell. And I'll show that by showing an arrow with two arrowheads on the opposite ends. So it has an equal concentration of solute on both sides of the cell, outside the cell and inside the cell. It's equal. And because of that, we also know that the concentration of water is also the same inside and outside the cell. That means that water on the outside of the cell is moving into the cell at the same rate and concentration as water is leaving the cell. And this results in a properly balanced, a water balanced cell, a healthy cell. As a review of what we just talked about here, you could go to figure 7.12 in your textbook. We're not going to talk about it here in this podcast, but I want you to think about why a plant cell, when it's placed in a hypotonic or an isotonic or a hypertonic solution, does not have this exact same result. Why is that? And as a hint, think about these two things up here. Tonicity requires the consideration of the solute concentration and the permeability of the membrane. So on your own, um, think about why a plant cell is going to behave differently. All right, let's move to uh, the next slide here. Get out a blank piece of, piece of paper. And I want to introduce a term very similar to diffusion that we just talked about. There's a slight difference. And that term is facilitated diffusion. Now, just like passive diffusion and osmosis, facilitated diffusion also moves solutes in the concentration of high to low, and it also does not require energy. So in that sense, it's very similar to diffusion, passive diffusion. However, let's draw a real quick membrane here. Okay, now that we have a, an, an attempt at drawing a membrane here, let's ask why we need this new term, facilitated diffusion. When we talk about passive diffusion, even if I didn't say it, I may have forgotten to say it, but we, you can go back and write that in your notes. Passive diffusion is really talking about nonpolar molecules, molecules that can freely move across that membrane things like oxygen or carbon dioxide. However, we know that molecules like calcium, a charge molecule or a polar molecule, also need to move across this membrane. But we know that polar molecules and charge molecules 
cannot freely move across this membrane. So they require the use of a transport protein, or better to call it a channel protein or a carrier protein. And for all practical purposes, they behave very similarly. A channel protein, let's draw this in blue, is just as the name implies. It forms a channel that the calcium or whatever molecule we're talking about can go across. Now, a carrier protein is slightly different. It will go through some transitions. Let me see if I can draw one here. What will happen here is the molecule, and we'll just stick with our friend calcium, it will bind into this carrier protein. And when it binds, the protein changes shape. And what will happen next is this calcium molecule will now be in the middle. Let's go ahead and draw more of the um, membrane to make, make to see if this makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so we have this carrier protein that has calcium now in the middle, but we need to get calcium on this side of the membrane. And so what happens is another conformational change occur, a change in the shape of the protein, in such a way that now the protein looks something like this. Right now calcium is over here. And now it can enter this side of the cell. Now, as we said before, I want to make this clear that facilitative diffusion will only move towards the concentration gradient, with the concentration gradient, meaning that in this scenario here, calcium must be at a low concentration, I'm sorry, at a high concentration on this side of the membrane. And it's moving to this side of the membrane where it's a lower concentration. Again, facilitated diffusion moves with the concentration gradient from high to low. It's used by, to get polar molecules and charged molecules across a membrane, remembering that these kinds of molecules cannot freely move across the membrane as nonpolar molecules can. Okay, let's look at the next slide here. And let's talk about active transport. Unlike passive diffusion or facilitated diffusion or osmosis, active transport goes against the gradient, meaning it goes from a low concentration, show it with a down arrow, to a high concentration. In addition, it requires energy. So this is an energy dependent transport. So this makes this much different. And the reason it requires energy is that we are going against the gradient. So a good example of this is looking at sodium and potassium. And don't worry so much about why sodium and potassium are in these concentrations and why they have to work against the gradient in order to achieve uh, proper physiology. You'll get more of that when you take cell biology or physiology. But for right now, we just want to use this as an example to explain active transport. So let's draw two cells. In the top cell, let's look at sodium. And let's say, as is the case, sodium is at a low concentration in the cell. Outside the cell, let's go and give it two molecules of sodium. Outside the cell, there's all kinds of sodium. It's at a very high concentration outside the cell. But as I drew, drew here, we have low concentration sodium inside the cell, high concentration outside the cell. Now potassium is the exact opposite. Potassium is high in the cell. and it's low outside the cell. Now, if this was a case of facilitated 
diffusion, we would have sodium going inside the cell and potassium going outside the cell so that we would have this equal equilibrium of these two ions um, on both sides of the membrane. However, what the cell does is what you would probably not expect. Potassium is going from this low concentration outside the cell and it's being transported into the cell to increase the concentration of potassium in the cell. In addition, sodium, which is high outside the cell and low inside the cell, it is pumping sodium outside the cell. Again, against the gradient, going from a low concentration to a high concentration. This is not the way you would expect it to move naturally. Because of this, moving against the gradient, going from a low concentration to a high concentration, it requires a fair amount of energy. I'm just going to put a big E here for energy. And the form of energy it uses, and we'll talk about this in the next chapter, is ATP. So these are, this is a very energy expensive process. And as you take further classes, um, you'll understand why it's really important that the sodium and potassium maintain this unique balance of high sodium on the outside and high potassium on the inside. Now, as a review, a few things you could do. You could look at figure 716. I'd also have you fill out the table at the bottom of your note-taking guide. In that table, it asks you to compare active transport, facilitated transport, and passive um, diffusion, asking whether or not it goes against the gradient, with the gradient, if it requires a protein to move, and if it um, um, move, moves with, if it requires energy. Now, one thing I did not mention as I just gave that brief review is I didn't clarify how these um, ions move against the gradient. This is a really important concept that just kind of slipped my mind. They do so because they have these transport proteins in the membrane. We don't need to worry too much about them right now, except that they behave similarly as far as changing their shape as you see with the facilitated um, transport proteins except in this case they require energy. But it does require these transport proteins to move these um, ions against the gradient. All right, your chapter here ends with um, the explanation of a couple terms here, endocytosis and exocytosis. And it's easier to talk about this by showing this video. It's kind of hard to explain this by, by drawing it. Um, so we're going to um, show this short little video here, and we're going to see in a moment that endocytosis is broken up into um, three different categories. But the only two categories we're interested in for the purpose of this class are pinocytosis and phagocytosis in, in relation to the endocytosis. We'll talk about exocytosis in a moment. So let's begin with endocytosis. It's important to remember that cells, such as this animal cell here, will bring in material from outside the cell. It does this for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it needs the nutrients within this um, particle here, nutrients that this cell now will use. Sometimes this may be part of the immune system where it brings in a foreign invader so it can destroy it. But we call this endocytosis. Endo for bringing things inside of the cell. This is a general term and now we can break it up into phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. For the purpose of this class, we're not going to worry about this third one right now. Just focus on these top two. Phagocytosis is when we bring in a large particle, like a bacterial cell. Think of this as cellular eating. We're bringing a large particle in for the cell to eat. It will eventually fuse with the lysosome and be destroyed. Now, pinocytosis, let me hit pause here. Think of that as cellular drinking. It brings in large volumes of fluid into the cell. Now, it's not just water. There's nutrients and other things inside of this that the cell will use. But by and large, we think of it as bringing in a liquid amount of, of fluid. So we think of it as cellular drinking. 
Now let's think about exocytosis. We've already talked about this, we just didn't call it exocytosis. If you remember a, a couple chapters back, or maybe it was the last chapter, we talked about the endomembrane system. In the endomembrane system, we um, started making a protein from the nucleus, it entered the ER, it entered Golgi stacks, and then it formed these vesicles. We call them vesicles before, um, and these secretory vesicles are now involved in exocytosis. And these vesicles, once they um, form from the Golgi, they will fuse with the plasma membrane, as we just saw, and it will cause these, these particles that were being packaged to be exported outside of the cell. So we call it exocytosis for exiting the cell. Okay, that ends Chapter 7. If you have any questions, please come see one of us, and we'll be happy to help you. Um, good luck, and we'll see you in class. Bye.